Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, in the next uh, few minutes or so here, we started at 1045. So, you know, usually get out at 12. Last week, got about 1215, 1220. So uh, just hold on. Uh, don't, uh, don't run. Don't start yawning, looking at your watch, you know, looking over your shoulder and seeing what time it is. Uh, but I want you to turn with me today to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Yeah, yeah Joshua 24. Joshua 24. Now, we're not going to read the, uh, the whole chapter uh, because there's a lot in there. I'm going to start at the 15th verse as I did in the first service. We're doing the same thing. Last week, I preached the same message, but it sure came out two different ways. Same title, let's say. Last week was the same title, but two different messages. Uh, pretty much two different messages. Uh, t- today, my thought is, which I'm going to work on it for a few weeks probably, an established home brings God's blessing. I just really felt in my heart that it was to, I was to minister uh, on the family for a while. You know, we've had so much going on that this was a time to bring some things biblically dealing with the family. God loves family. That's why he, that's why he started it all because he wanted a family. God knew that uh, this was what he, this is what he desired. God wants a family and uh, families all look different. You know that? Families all look different, and uh, it's it's amazing uh, how this works, and that's how God's family, we're all different, but we all have the same heart and ambition as to follow him. So here we go, Joshua. Joshua's one of three that came out of, well, he's one of three that became leaders. Joshua, along uh, Joshua and Caleb, followed or was ministered together with Moses. Three of them should have made it from Egypt all the way to the promised land, but only two, not even Moses, made it on the journey. Now, when they, I mentioned this morning, when they crossed the river Jordan, Joshua was the one who God spoke to and said, my servant Moses is dead, now you rise up. Get out of this intimidation. Get out of this fear. You're going to lead my people to the promised land. So it was through Joshua's ministry that they crossed over this Jordan and was heading into a place called the land of Canaan, which is the promised land. Now, I realize, as I mentioned today, not going into it at length, I think it still helps people. There's, there's Christian songs and there's gospel messages preached that heaven is a type and shadow of Canaan land. I, I have never, uh, I've never uh, embraced that thought because it just never could settle my heart because Canaan land was the place where God wanted his people to go. Remember when they sent the spies out, 10 of them came back and said, we're not able to do this because there's giants in the land. Now, when they got into Canaan land, the first thing they faced was a city called Jericho. Jericho was occupied by the enemy, a city that was never been to be taken. And in within this, within this Canaan land, they had to fight a battle. Jericho, God won the battle for them. And then they went into Ai and they fought, fought other battles. This is where Achan took the forbidden thing and he was judged and cursed. Let me tell you, when you get to heaven, heaven, there's not going to be any forbidden things to take. There won't be any more earth opened up and you falling in. No one will be an enemy to God. No more tears, no more crying. It's all going to be established. Amen. So what does Canaan Canaan land represent, pastor? It represents a place that we live in right now in God's promises. And we know that through God, we'll defeat every enemy by the help of the power of God. Amen. We are not we are not, not, that the song says, I'm on my way. You know, the song says, I'm on my way to Canaan land. I'm not. If you want to adopt any of them, you can say I'm camping in it because we are in it right now. We're in it right now. Amen. Heaven's not going to be, there's not going to be any more giants. No more battles to be fought. No more victories to be won. The final battle is won. All right. It has been. So Joshua, through all of this and all the turmoil he had, verse 15, he said, he says, and, it, and if it seemed evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. You got to make a choice. I call it a decision of quality. You got to make a choice. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites and whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, this is more than just a, a, a picture in your house, more than just a banner you hang on the wall. This is something that he battled through and he said. For the people answered and said, 
Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. Now, that there's, you can go on down and be blessed by the rest of it. So there's a statement in here, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, when we talk about this, you got to understand, it's got to go beyond words. This has got to, this has got to be something that solidifies in your heart. A saying that I've made for years. You can say whatever you want to say, right, wrong, or indifferent. But you're only going to be able to walk out by faith what you really believe. You can't walk out by faith what you don't believe. You know, a lot of people can speak big, boisterous words and, and sound really good in front of people. But the truth is you can only do what you believe. If you don't believe it, you can't do it. You can, you can act as spiritual as you want, but somewhere down the line, the cover's going to be rolled back and you're going to be seen for who you really are. Now, as for me and my house, that doesn't mean all of our houses are perfect, but we got to make sure God is priority in our house. Amen. Amen. I tell you when America was the greatest, when God was in the White House to your house, Amen. that's when America was the greatest. Amen. Amen. But the truth is, we got to make sure that we understand God wants the family strong. During this time, families have spent more time together than ever before. There's some things that's come out of this that I have liked and enjoyed seeing people doing. Life is busy. Life has been really busy. I know people have struggled maybe not having jobs and laid off. But look, people are eating dinner together, together at night. They're, they're eating together. They're talking together. You know, we're not out at restaurants, which we all miss, I'm sure. But they're not out at restaurants and whatever. But they're sitting together at home, either cooking or went out and bought it and brought it in. There's some, there's some things dealing with the family unit that, that has been missing that I think was good to be able to enjoy again. Uh, some things that we have. Now, I'm not getting into all of the other negative side of it because I got a message that I want to preach here. But families, uh, this is a time where we can look together and say, thank God that we have a family. Now, I really believe in my heart it was God's plan to have a family. My heart goes out to single parented families where a dad is, has children or, or, or the mom is trying to raise children. You know, I don't believe that God ever called the dad anointing him to be a mom. And I don't believe God anointed mom to be a dad. And so, but I thank God that he helps single family units, uh, single parent families to really function. Amen. That's why I think a church that's a whole, when people bring their kids and bring their families in here and we have the right kind of nursery and the right kind of preschool and the right kind of children's church and the right kind of youth, because not all families come from a solid foundation as some of you come from, but God is a rewarder of diligence. God has a place in his heart for all. That's like on Mother's Day last week. We have people here that have mothered, that have mothered and brought kids up that they didn't even give birth to. But they're just as much a mother because they have played the role and they've allowed God to anoint them and to be up on them so they could do this. Now turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel, chapter 16. Matthew's Gospel, 16. I, I didn't have my bookmark here. I thought I'd turn with you so we could almost arrive about the same time. Amen? Starting at verse 13. <clears throat> then Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. When he came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? They said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, without a doubt I know you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you. The word blessed means to empower, to prosper. And when, when, whenever 
Peter made this statement, Jesus said right off the bat, because of this understanding, because of this revelation that you just received, blessed are you. You are now empowered. Let me tell you, God wants to empower his people. God wants to empower families. God wants to, God wants us to be empowered. The word bless is to empower, to prosper. Not just money, but thank God it includes it. But he wants us to be empowered, prosper, spirit, soul, and body. I wish above all things that you, that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So to the amount that you renew your mind, your soul to the word of God, it's going to be to the amount that you prosper in the things that you desire. So you have to do this. So Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, let's read here. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father's in heaven. If he was just referring to the name of Jesus, Jesus is the rock. If he was just referring to Jesus, that wouldn't have been a secret because everybody knew him as Jesus. Or in the Hebrew tongue, uh, that, that language that, 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 that they had. Uh, Yeshua. Everybody knew him as that. But Peter brought something out that wasn't common. He brought out that you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. And when the anointed one comes, he's going to come to lift burdens and he's going to come to destroy yokes and he's going to reign supreme because he is the anointed one. Jesus said, you are now empowered. You are now empowered. Let's read on. I'm I'm using this to deal with the family. And he says, and Peter, and he said, you are Peter. And upon this rock... I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock. Now, what rock is he referring to? He wasn't referring to Peter as a rock. He was referring to this divine revelation about Jesus being the Christ, the the, the head cornerstone about being the Messiah. He said, this is the revelation that he brought. He said, based upon this revelation, this revelation is rock solid. You build upon this revelation, you will never fall to anything. Families have been scattered abroad. Families have waned and waned around. But the truth is, we have got to get back to the revelation of God's word as families. Families are not perfect. My family isn't perfect. I've, I spoke about it this morning. I've spoke about it before. Amen? I'm a, today, I'm pastor. When we get done and we go home, I'm daddy. I'm, I'm husband as well. Now, I want to live with the same principles and same values there as I do here. And that's what I endeavor. That's why I'm not backwards to apologize when I've said something wrong, repent when I've done something wrong. I'd never, I'd never use the excuse, well, I'm the boss, I'm the leader, I can do it. I'm quick to, re- I'm quick to forgive, I'm quick to repent, I'm, I'm quick to get things right. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter because I don't want anything to mess with that anointing or that gift that's inside of me. Nothing, I don't want anything. So with that, as strong as a family we may have, we're still a family. We still have teenage boy. We still have a girl that was still a teenager. She'll be 20 here soon. And then my oldest has kids of her own that she's learning from and and probably says, oh, I should have been better to daddy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, but the, but the point is, the, the point is that God is looking for his hand to be up on us as families, as families, all families operate different, but we got to have a common denominator. And that is Jesus must be Lord in our homes. You know, you don't have to preach a sermon every day to your kids, but you have to live the word. Your life is a message you preach. Your life becomes a message you preach. You know, I, you know, I, I hear people say things, you know, about how when it comes to faith, you know, got to guard your mouth, got to guard your heart. I preach that and I've had people, you know, people told me to my face, I think you push your words too far. Well, I got born again by my words. By my words, I'm condemned. By my words, I'm justified. I don't know how else that you can push it any further. Amen. Let the weak say, I am strong. He didn't say, let the weak think it. He said, let the weak say it. Psalms 91 is very important. He that dwelleth, it says that uh, he that uh, uh, dwelleth, 
dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide and shall the Almighty. The very next thing the psalmist said, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God and him will I trust. He didn't say, I think it. He said, I will. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And the very next thing, under an old covenant, covenant lifestyle, he said, I will use my words to create my reality. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. And in him will I trust. Amen. That's right. Words are powerful. But I've had people say, amen, words are powerful. But then when I hear the words, I don't think they really believe it. Because you will only act out what you believe. What is it? It's got to become revelation to you. Things has got to become a revelation to you. It can't just be information. What Peter received this day wasn't just information. It was revelation. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. It wasn't information. Folks, for our families to be strong and for the blessing of God to be up on our families, we can't just keep going by information. We've got to allow God's word to create such revelation in our lives and our families like we've never had before. We have got to be able to stand against all this foolishness and all of this stuff that people hear. You know, we can't guard our kids' ears from everything, our grandkids. They listen to things, things are on the news. They, they go to school, the school tells them this and everything. Even if it's contrary to what you teach and preach, you have, we have got to have solid revelations in our home if this thing is going to be solidified right. We've got to know how to separate what's real and what's not. What's life? from death. You, you, got, you got to be able to separate life and death. And the words that are spoken, you got to be able to divide this. Amen? Because what you believe, what you believe is going to affect your life. Words are powerful. Even secular psychologists. Don't speak harsh to children. You'll warp them. Why do you mean you warp them? Words. But then they hear me preach like this, they'll say, he's crazy. Well, you just said don't, don't tell a kid he's worthless. You can't do anything because you'll form an image inside of him that he is. Well, God figured that out a long time ago. That he told you exactly who you were. Why? So he can form an image inside of you. And he told us exactly what a family was like so he could form an image inside of us, what we need to do as families. Amen. Now, I could come in here as before and, and preach, a, you know, preach a good message on how to stay out of fear again and, and how to stay bold. But the truth is, I want us to take these opportunities and when we come out of this, we don't just come out of it having church. We come out of it victorious in our homes Amen. because it's the strong family unit that makes a strong church. Right. You are the church. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, tell me any Christian home is not part of the church. So that means... Even though you're a family, you're still the church. So if he says, upon this rock, I'll build my church, then he's going to build you as a family. He's going to build you as a family at the same time. I'm, I'm thankful that we can have things as, as family. Uh, I gave the example this morning. I've, only one time, only one time in the 14 years pastoring here have I ever spent time pre-marital counseling with people. I've done a lot. I think the first year I was here, I married, did a wedding for like eight or nine people in one year. That's a lot of counseling. <laughs> and uh, this one couple, I didn't actually do the wedding, but I did all of the premarital counseling because they had somebody else do the wedding, but they were not pastoring a church. So they asked me as their pastor if I would do the counseling. So I did. That's when my office was back there where the men's restroom is now. And I spent more time with them than I did any other couple from that time to now in premarital counseling. It's the only couple that I ever said, if I were you, I would not get married. I would not do this. If I were you, I would not do this. Oh, we're in love. We're in love. We're in love. I'm thinking, uh-huh. And you're in a whole lot of other mess too. We're in love. So they had about three months of bliss. I mean, three weeks. I said this morning, three weeks. They had three weeks of bliss. After that, it was, it was, five, it was five months of hell. And the sixth month, they were separated and divorced. Didn't even make it a year. Didn't even make it a year. You could say you should have listened. 
but nobody I've ever married or did counsel that didn't think, oh, we're gonna have the best marriage in the world. I tell them, when you come and see me, we're gonna talk about marriage. We're not talking about a wedding. For one year, you plan a wedding, plan a wedding, plan a wedding, plan a wedding. Nobody thinks about a marriage. There's two different elements. People struggle because they spend all that money preparing for a wedding. And then when the wedding's over, they're in something called a marriage. <laughs> dirty underwear, dirty socks, bad bra. I mean, uh, this thing is marriage, man. This thing is marriage. It happens. <laughs> and then... Well, we had Scott in the first service. We got Doug, I guess, in this service. He told a story, you know. A woman's upset because her husband's not really, you know, doesn't really speak sweet to her, romantic to her, and doesn't say he loves her. And his concept was, well, I told her and I married her. I loved her. Why do I need to keep telling her? You know? But, uh, but the truth is, God is love. And God wants to be seen in our lives. God wants to be seen in our homes. So I'm going to admonish you that you've got to allow a foundation to be built in your families and continue to allow foundation being built in your families and continue to allow the word of God to come up out of your heart so that you can not just indoctrinate your kids, but that they see it working. They see it working. Folks, it's not just here that I pray. No sickness, no plague, no disaster, no destruction or disease. It's up on my kids. It's not just here that we pray and believe God over everything we eat, drink, and breathe. It's everyday life. It's not here that I talk about how sweet this woman is to me. It's every day in front of my kids. that go, uh, it's every day. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's every day. It doesn't matter. It's not because I just want a happy home and I'm, going to, I'm just going to fake it until I make it. No. It's because I want God to be glorified. I want him to help me. I want my children, my grandchildren, to know that a house is more than a place you live. We're, only, we're part of a church. We're not just part of an individual family unit. Brittany may be married with two children, but she's still part of the church. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. She, this, thing, this thing isn't divided. What I do in my house is my business. What I do at church is my business. No, 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 no. I understand people think that way. But the truth is, what happens in your home affects the church. It affects it here. It affects it here. It affects it here. Do you think if Angel and I had a big argument this morning, it wouldn't affect me in this pulpit? Come on. Do you think if Josh and I had a big argument, it wouldn't affect him on them drums? Could you imagine his face up there? <laughs> He's got my image printed on that bass drum. <laughs> Come on. You're telling me that our attitudes as we come in here, not every time you could be riding to church and your kids are on your back, oh, I give you glory, glory. <laughs> I give you glory. No, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> this thing affects our life. And God wants to bless our homes. He wants to bless our families. He wants to empower us. He wants the word of knowledge. He wants understanding and wisdom to fill our individual lives outside of this house. I want to be anointed as a dad. I want her to be anointed as a mother. And like I said, you that play both roles, my God, as a church, we got to stand and we got to pray. And we, we, we have to help out because the devil is looking for any kind of weak area. He's not just looking for an open door anymore. He's just looking for an open opportunity. He don't even have to realize the door's open. He just wants to find an opportunity, as Justin did, to pull one more block out of your marriage, out of your life. One more block. Mar Husband and wife, listen. If your marriage is not strong, I'd start working on it right now because the day is getting darker. 
the day's getting darker and I'd start, I'd start getting on it. Men, I start, I start telling her right now how good she looks, how wonderful she is, what kind of mother she is. Well, she used to when she's in her 20. You better fix your doctrine. <laughs> you better fix your doctrine right now. Yeah, but he had big chest muscles back then. Have you seen him now? You better, woman, you better fix your doctrine. <laughs> yeah, I had, I had nice hair when Angel met me. Nice hair. Nice hair. Nice hair. I had nice hair. She met me. We were driving one day and she reached over and went like this to me. What are you doing, woman? She saw this sag. I didn't marry that sag. Well, yes, you did. You just didn't know it. That's marriage. That's not wedding stuff. That's marriage. And God wants to build that marriage stronger than ever before. And we've had people, we got people here married a lot of years. But as good as it is, it can get better. God wants our homes to reflect who he is. And he wants, and he wants our homes to play a part of the church Amen. And the church will play a part of the home because they're interchangeable. Amen. You are the church. It's not this building. You are the church. Hallelujah. Now, I don't say I'm married to Sister Angel. Sister Angel, will you come here? No. So there is a little difference. (laughs) But the truth is, we're part of the church. Don't miss my point. Enjoy my humor. Don't miss my point. <laughs> but we got to do this together. We got to do it right. Amen. Amen. God wants our households blessed. Now, I read some more verses I didn't get to in this one because you guys were are too uh, energetic. <laughs> I had more time to preach in the first one. No. <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, anything, whatever you invest into a strong family, it's going to pay off. I promise you, that'd be one return you're going to enjoy. Uh, Pastor, I, I've been divorced. I've been, I've, I've went through all of this. I went through all that. Can God really do supernatural things back through me again? Let me tell you, God is a redeemer. God is a redeemer. I've had people tell me that you'll never be successful in ministry. You'll never do this. You'll never do that. I look back and I looked at some of them where they're at and where I'm at. I say, thank God, he's a redeemer. So regardless of what you go through, he still is gonna bring you out, amen? He's still gonna bring you out. So if you've been, if you're newly married or oldly married, just don't be crotchety married. (laughs) Amen? All right, let's stand together. (laughs) Hallelujah, where'd that come from? Dear God. (laughs) Did we just preach not long ago about grumpy old men? God wants to reign supreme in our home. He wants to reign supreme in our home. We, and I mean, this is something we don't get by. You don't get by with. Number one, no one in our household goes to bed angry at one another. Uh, you can, but we're going to make sure it's worked out. And there's going to be hugs and kisses for it all before we go drops to directions. You will camp out in the middle of our bed. Not you. (laughs) You work your own salvation out. (laughs) But Josh and Maddie will camp out in the middle of our bed until we work through these things. Brittany was the same way when she was there. It doesn't matter. We don't go to bed angry. We don't leave the house mad. There's people I've dealt with has never got over because a loved one lost their life in a wreck because they left the house mad. We won't do that. And we don't leave church mad. 
We don't leave church in strife. We don't leave church disunified. We are going to be a family. This church is a family. Our household's a family. Under God's banner, it's love. And we're not going to give place to the devil at all. How's that? Amen. Amen. Or the family of God. The family of God. Bow your heart. Father, I thank you. I thank you today for your goodness. We love you. We honor you. We declare blessing upon, upon everyone today by your word. I pray for strength upon every family. <clears throat> today, if you would say, Pastor, my family needs help. My family needs help. We're, we're, we're going through things and I don't want... I, I, I don't want to lose ground in my family unit at home. If that's you, just, just lift your hand to the Lord right where you're at. Amen. Father, you see the hands and the hearts, and I pray now in the name of Jesus for your word, for the angels of God, the spirit of God to move in our lives, to move in our families. I thank you for peace and unity in the name above every name. Peace and unity. Turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. May there be love between the mom and the dad. And Father, those who are single parenting, may you empower them and bring them joy that they're not discouraged, distressed, and oppressed. I'm asking you for it. Now, Father, I decree and I thank you. You said... Speaking of angels, are they not all ministering spirit sent forth to minister for them who are heirs of salvation? I thank you that they will bear us up lest we dash our foot against a stone. And therefore we say together, angels, take charge. And I decree that no sickness, no plague, no disaster, no destruction or disease shall come near you. In the name of Jesus, amen.